initially. So Dr. Jenny Rohrbach Carson um, is a geriatrician practicing in the outpatient, inpatient, and nursing home settings. Along with Christina Cosley, Dr. Rohrbach Carson works in the Fall Prevention Clinic at Harborview Medical Center. She's also a medical director for an adult day health organization that provides services to support vulnerable adults living in the community. And Dr. Christina Cosley has been a physical therapist since 2001. She's focused her practice on the outpatient treatment of geriatric patients with a history of falls and patients at risk for falls. She works as part of the multidisciplinary team in the Falls Clinic as well at Harborview Medical Center, where patients are seen for a comprehensive fall risk assessment and treatment. So as you can see, they both are very qualified to um, inform us today about fall prevention, a primary care perspective. Welcome. All right, thank you very much. Yes, so my name is Jenny. I'm a a geriatrician and um, really have an interest in falls. So I'm excited to have this opportunity to talk about fall prevention and um, all the aspects that are so accessible and applicable to um, folks caring for elders in all sorts of settings, but especially primary care. So I don't really have any conflicts to disclose, so we'll just jump right in. So today I'm hoping that we can learn how to identify the common extrinsic and intrinsic factors that cause falls and how to identify how to address those that are modifiable uh, utilizing the CDC's study toolkit as a resource and guide. And then I'm also hoping that we can all learn how to deprescribe medications for patients with the goal of reducing fall risk and also how to enhance mobility and safety for patients by evaluating gait, providing equipment recommendations, and referring to evidence-based exercise programs. So we're going to attempt to cover a lot of ground in, in this time, but uh, do the best we can. And of course, ask questions along the way. I um, really appreciate others' thoughts and inputs too. So just to give a little info about the context or the um, you know, magnitude of the problem with falls, every second an older adult is falling in our country. And in 2018, these are numbers from the CDC website, 2018, we had 36 million falls, 8 million injuries, 3 million ER visits, almost a million hospitalizations, and 32,000 deaths. And unfortunately, those numbers are just projected to increase by 2030, increasing from 52 million to 73 million. And, you know, among um, all these falls, death is a significant risk. And, you know, uh, falls actually are the leading cause of injury related death among adults to over 65. So, beating out things like car accidents. And the age adjusted fall death rate actually increased by 41% from 55.3 per 100,000 people or, or older adults in 2012 up to 78 per 100,000 older adults in 2021. So they seem to be leading to more deaths. And some theories as to why that happened may be that there are more older adults, you know, living longer and more an increased number of years living frail and vulnerable to poor outcomes from falls. So despite knowing that this is a huge problem um, leading to a great deal of morbidity and mortality, um, despite all that, when we look at the reality of how we respond to falls in like settings like the emergency department, from this study here in 2006, we learned that the history of falls are rarely elicited, fall risk factors are usually not identified, and most elders seen in the ER for falls had no recommendation or appointment for follow-up beyond the acute injury. So we um, in the medical system do a great job of addressing injuries, responding, you know, to the fracture or the brain injury or the other injury. But um, there seems to be a bit of blindness 
to looking deeper, looking to what, what caused the fall. Um, and I can say among the trainees that I work with, it's something that I have to tell them all the time, my, the residents who are um, learning to become internal medicine docs or the, or the fellows learning to become geriatricians. You know, you've told me about the, the fracture and what the surgeon's gonna do and what medications we're tweaking to get ready for the surgery and the rehab they're gonna need and all of that. But can we go back to what happened? How did this person fall? What made them fall? And um, the other objective I'm hoping that everyone can learn from today is to avoid the temptation to cause, to, to attribute a fall to one single factor. And, and often we have a tendency to blame what we call mechanical ground level falls as we can categorize them as being sort of non-medical or something not worthy of further evaluation or investigation or something that that the medical community can't really do anything about, that this person is just a faller and it's inevitable. Um, so I'm hoping that, you know, as I think, you know, and on this call, I'm sure there are many people who know better than that. I'm not accusing you of anything, but it's something that I encounter a lot in with my trainees um, to be dismissive of the ground level fall as something purely mechanical um, and sort of missing the picture, missing what's causing the falls. So we do know that looking into the, the source or the cause of someone's falling and providing multifactorial interventions does in fact reduce falls in people living out in the community. And in addition to reducing falls, we can improve physical functioning, improve quality of life, and these are very cost-effective measures. So having the ability to provide multifactorial interventions is just really important. Um, and the impact um, on fall prevention has uh, a, additional benefits as outlined here with physical functioning quality of life. So these, this list here kind of encompasses really the big factors of, of um, falls. We have them split into two lists, essentially intrinsic factors, things that are going on within the patient or the individual, and extrinsic factors, things that are happening to them or influencing them externally. So intrinsically, commonly we have leg weakness, balance impairment, and gait abnormality happening. Additionally, things like vision impairment, vitamin D deficiency, comorbid conditions, and orthostatic hypotension. Those are all the categories of things that can happen within a patient, especially in the geriatric population that contribute to falls. Extrinsically, we have things like their assistive device, the use of it, the fit, the um, inappropriate use, the um, malfunctioning, et cetera, of the assistive device, um, environmental factors or home hazards, footwear, and then things like medications or alcohol substances that might be um, contributing to falls. So we're going to go through each of these. These ones highlighted in pink are the ones that Christina is gonna cover as the physical therapist and expert in these areas. And I'm gonna to touch on these other factors, kind of going through them one by one. So just to start off here with vision impairment. So there are two things that happen with eyes as we get older. There are normal things that happen with aging that are not really in the you know, pathologic, uh, category. So as we age, our lens becomes less elastic and we can become more farsighted um, or develop presbyopia. And additionally, um, the pupillary response to light variation um, is not as um, responsive or not as quick. So things like you know, go, going into a dark movie theater might be a, a fall risk 
or going back to bed after you've been in the bathroom with the light on, that might contribute to fall risk. So light variation is a factor and vision in general can decline with age. And of course, with that reduced sensory input, you're gonna increase fall risk. And then on top of that, um, diseases of the eye start to increase in prevalence as you get older with cataract, macular degeneration and glaucoma being some of the big ones. And moving on to vitamin D deficiency, the vitamin D has become a little bit more controversial as there's been some conflicting data out there about what to do with vitamin D supplementation. And it seems that there is some data to show that maybe a blanket vitamin D recommendation for all people for fall prevention is not necessarily um, based in strong evidence. But we do know that vitamin D deficiency contributes to a loss of muscle mass, decreased strength, and hip fracture risk. And it seems reasonable that vitamin D supplementation be recommended for individuals who are at risk for falls or those at risk for low vitamin D. So for those patients who've had a prior fall, say, or who tell you they feel unsteady or who appear slowed down or um, have other factors that make you concerned about fall risk, it is very easy, low hanging fruit to make sure that that patient is taking a vitamin D supplement. Um, and for those in facilities, living in facilities, spending minimal time outdoors, um, they are at very high risk for a low vitamin D level. Obesity is also linked with low vitamin D. And of course, if someone has a history of malabsorption, they're at higher risk for vitamin D deficiency. So all of those individuals should be on a vitamin D supplement. And the dosing recommendations vary, but about 800 to 1,000 units daily is a reasonable range. And there has been some data to show that giving in, uh, frequent high doses or high doses even at a less frequent basis might carry some risks with it. So sticking with sort of a dose around 800 to 1,000, some say as low as 600 units a day, um, but around there is a, a safe recommendation. Now, talking a little bit more about why people fall, there are a myriad of comorbid conditions that can contribute to falling, and I'll just cover those here. So I talked about the vision um, factors that contribute, and also hearing loss can contribute to falling. So just imagining yourself, if your ears are stuffed with cotton, that that loss of sensory input can make you feel less certain, less confident in your environment. There may be environmental cues that you're not able to pick up on because of the loss of hearing. And as far as cardiovascular conditions, you know, orthostasis, or that's the drop in blood pressure that occurs when standing, that can contribute to feeling dizzy, unsteady, and falls. Similarly, aortic stenosis, or a, a, heart, a, a tight aortic heart valve, essentially, can contribute. Bradycardia, meaning slow heart rate, um, which could make you feel dizzy, um, fatigued, contribute to falling. And CHF, or congestive heart failure, which um, can contribute to feeling short of breath, fatigued when walking, and um, these patients often will have significant swelling, of course, in the legs, and that swelling in itself can make it very difficult to ambulate if you are sort of waterlogged down with um, a great deal of weight, uh, fluid weight in the legs that contributes to falling. And even that fluid can impair sensation in the feet, but not being able to feel um, where you're walking uh, as well related to edema contributes to falls. And musculoskeletal conditions, of course, arthritis is a big one, but deformities, chronic pain, spinal stenosis, and all of this to say anything that can alter your gait, make you walk funny, make your center of gravity displaced in some um, way can contribute to falling, right? If, if you're already displaced, if you're hunched over, if you're having to favor one leg, all of these things can make you more vulnerable to falling 
if something is going to challenge your balance and push you past where you can correct yourself. So um, all of those things can contribute to, to falls, especially foot pain. So um, foot pain has a very high associated risk of falling. Um, and I think, again, because of the impact on gait. Urological conditions, you know, incontinence and nocturia. If someone is rushing to the bathroom, that is a very common story um, leading to falls. Sleep deprivation is a fall risk, insomnia, um, which of course is a bit of a catch-22 because many of the medications that are tried to help with sleep can also increase fall risk. So working really diligently on non-pharmacological interventions is very important uh, when you're trying to address falls in these patients with sleep issues. Um, depression itself can be a fall risk factor as well. And Neurological conditions that contribute to falls, there are many. Um, stroke, of course, if somebody's had a stroke and has a motor deficit or sensory deficit resulting from that, or perhaps even a cerebellar stroke, which can impact balance. Dementia contributes to falls on many levels, especially with impairments in you know, motor planning or safety awareness, impulsivity, um, all of, and, you know, wandering behaviors, excessive pacing, all of that can contribute to falls. Peripheral neuropathy is a big one, very common contributor to falls and is something that um, we see at a very high frequency in the falls clinic. You know, of course, if you can't feel your feet or if you've lost proprioception, which is the sensation of where your feet are in space, if that ability has been impaired, it makes it very difficult to walk with a steady base. And you'll often note that those patients will widen their gait, widen their base, um, widen up their feet to try to steady themselves. And those folks, and Christina will get into this, but they really need at some point an assistive device so that the information about where they are can essentially get through to them through their hand rather than their feet. So using a cane and eventually a walker. Um, and Parkinsonism is really notable as a fall risk. Um, and these folks, unfortunately, will fall due to several contributing factors. Um, of course, folks with Parkinson's disease have a shuffling gait, which makes it harder for them to clear, um, say, an uneven sidewalk or a curb um, or switch from one surface to another, a carpet to a hardwood floor or soft grass to the sidewalk. Um, they additionally have a uh, slow gait, so they're slower, and they have a harder time responding to an, any kind of <clears throat> perturbation of, of balance. So if something pushes, you know, a dog on a leash pulls them in a certain direction, it will be harder for them to come back to middle. And um, they also have um, trunkal rigidity, so they can be quite rigid and tight in the trunk, and if there's um, an insult to their balance or they're thrown off a bit, they to overcorrect and get tight and go backwards. And a fall backwards is um, a high risk of causing injury because, of course, you're landing on the back of your head and not with your hands out stretched in front of you, which is how we're all designed to protect our noggin, is to land with our hands outstretched. But they have the the misfortune of having this trunkal rigidity that will make them fall backwards. So I often, when somebody tells me that they've had a fall backwards, a lot of um, you know bells go off in my head, thinking about, gosh, well, what made them do that? And Parkinsonism is one of the um, concerns that I might think about. Um, other things that might alter their level of consciousness, you know substances or syncope, did they actually pass out? They intoxicated, um, did something really push them or pull them and um, force them to go backwards? Those are all things that we think about. And then we'll also talk about how folks with Parkinson's very frequently have um, orthostatic hypotension. And we'll talk about that next here. So, Orthostasis or post and postural dizziness. So just a reminder of what orthostatic hypotension is for everybody. That's a drop 
of your systolic blood pressure, blood pressure of at least 20, that's the top number going down by 20 or your bottom number, diastolic number going down by 10 or more within three minutes of standing from a sitting or lying position for at least five minutes. So to, to accurately measure this, someone needs to be sitting or lying for a good five minutes before attempting to measure a change. So in Falls Clinic, we will simply have them, we'll do a lying to standing and we can skip the sitting. Uh, efficiency with rooming patients in clinic is always important, right? Uh, but you can simplify your, your measurements to just be one, just the two positions and not worry about doing all three, lying, sitting, standing. Um, and for those who can't stand, you can just sitting. And um, you'll also want to note if there's a rise in pulse upon standing or if there's any symptoms of dizziness, regardless of the numbers. If, if somebody tells me that they're posturally dizzy, I'm essentially going to treat them the same as if, you know, they had true documented orthostasis numbers. And it's important to note that um, postural hypotension affects about a third of community dwelling elders. So it's exceedingly common. There's a lot of causes, you know, Parkinson's, as I mentioned, autonomic neuropathy, which sometimes you can see in advanced diabetes, um, aortic stenosis, volume depletion or dehydration, vasodilation, say from medications or heat or other causes, um, just being physically deconditioned. You know, if you're spending most of your life sitting or lying down, your body is not used to making those adjustments to standing up. And that you're going to see at very high frequency in other settings, like in a skilled nursing facility um, or in the hospital. Um, and postprandially also, so after you eat and all, your, all of your blood goes to your gut, that can also lead to some drop in blood pressure when you stand up from the dinner table. So common medications that cause orthostatic hypotension include diuretics, calcium channel blockers, that's your amlodipine and those kind of medications, beta blockers, all of those, uh, metoprolol, metoprolol, carvedilol, and nitrates, alpha blockers like doxazacin, prazacin, and to some extent, tamsulosin, um, tricyclic depress antidepressants, so those are your nortriptyline, uh, paroxetine or Paxil, venlafaxine, which is Effexor or trazodone, and then quetiapine is also notorious for causing orthostasis at higher doses. Um, and then levodopa also. So unfortunately, those with Parkinson's ha can have orthostasis contributed to by their medication as well as their underlying condition. Um, and I just asterisk some of the ones that are known to be um, especially high risk uh, because they can blunt, blunt the sympathetic uh, nervous system. And patients on multiple blood pressure medications where you're sort of blocking pathways of your blood pressure reflex system, if you're blocking at multiple points, your risk of being orthostatic goes up. So that's why often we recommend just take your first blood pressure medication and take that dose as high as you need it um, before adding a second agent, for example, that acts at a different part in the pathway. So environmental factors, um, you gotta look out for lighting issues, loose objects on the floor, uh, throw rugs are a common enemy in the Falls Clinic. I'm either begging patients to get rid of them or at least take their area rugs and tape them down with double-sided tape in the corners. Um, big extension cords, clutter, unsafe steps. So I'm always asking patients about the steps in their home, if they have a, a railing to hold on to, keeping items in hard to reach places. Uh, the bathroom is a notorious hot spot for falls with the slippery tub or shower. They're missing grab bars by the toilet, et cetera. Um, and step stools, ladders. I always tell my, my patients, you have no business getting on a step stool. Let's get rid of it. Let's ask a neighbor to help um, with getting that thing up and off or let's stop storing stuff out of reach if we can, uh, and pets underfoot. So all of these are common environmental factors. Footwear, just a brief note to say that, you know, the enemies are sandals, open back shoes, you know, your mules and slides, 
bare feet and stocking feet, high heels, flip flops, open back slippers, shoes that are too big or shoes that have smashed heels, like that little collage in the bottom left there. Um, a lot of folks have the, the mistaken belief that their bare feet helps them grip, <laughs> that they can grip the floor better with their bare feet. And I often have to educate them. Actually, bare feet and plain stocking feet are um, the riskiest for falls. The things I'm trying to encourage patients to wear are shoes with a good sole contact area, closed toe, covered heel, you know, athletic shoes, kind of ideal, um, non-skid hospital socks are what I'm often uh, issuing from clinic just to encourage people, hey, in the house, could you at least wear these um, in place of your flip-flops or your open deer, form, deer foams? And just to touch on medications here as well, the so polypharmacy is obviously a big issue in our patient population. Four or more meds equals fall risk, which equals a lot of our patients or a lot of people that we're interacting with. Um, certain classes of meds really impact balance. So any psychoactive med um, has at least somewhat of a risk of contributing to falls, but especially benzodiazepines, high dose SSRIs or antidepressants, sedative hypnotics, the so sleeping pills. I think logically we can understand that. Trazodone, as we said before, which is often taken for sleep, um, can contribute to falls. And those tricyclics, again, the amitriptyline, nortriptyline most commonly. The blood pressure earlier. Anticonvulsants can contribute to falls. And gabapentin is just um, you know widely prescribed for folks. And of course, it's appropriate for pain management in many cases, or in some cases we're using also for mood stability, but always checking in with patients when they've started something like gabapentin um, about how it may be impacting their balance, because it's it's not an entirely benign medication. Um, anticholinergics, uh, the true um, enemy in geriatrics, uh, can contribute to falls, certainly meclizine, oxybutynin among the bladder medications, and asking about over-the-counters, even like Benadryl, Tylenol PM, Dramamine. Um, always asking my patients if they're taking anything with a PM in it, um, because that means that it essentially has Benadryl diphenhydramine in it, which is significant for contributing to both cognitive impairment and uh, fall risk. Muscle relaxants also are notorious for contributing to falls, especially cyclobenzaprine, as that one um, has the highest CNS action um, and has anticholinergic effects as well. And opioids in high doses contribute to falls, as well as tramadol. Um, tramadol does essentially metabolize to an opioid, um, actually methadone and effexor is what it becomes after you metabolize it. And so certainly those medications can contribute to falling. I love this meme. I'm sorry I had to bring this presentation down to the level of a meme, but um, I thought everyone would appreciate a laugh. Um, I'm, I don't want to spend too much time on um, going down the road of deprescribing, but I did want to touch on it briefly just to say that you know, the de-prescribing process is a process, and you can think of it as having um, five steps. The first is really to identify uh, appropriate, potentially inappropriate meds, and really think about, do we need to continue it? How necessary is this? Is there a true benefit in it? May it, Could it be contributing to or causing an adverse reaction? Um, is there a future risk of adverse reaction down the line? You know, thinking about somebody perhaps with uh, declining renal function, um, thinking of course about medication or food interactions. If a patient is actually able to adhere to this medication, maybe the dosing is too burdensome, maybe they don't wanna take it. Um, maybe they have a preference against taking this medication. And then of course, goals of care and life expectancy. There are several resources um, to help in the process of identifying potentially inappropriate medications. Of course, the AGS beers criteria is there. And then there's actually also multiple resources to look into what the anticholinergic burden scale is of different medications. 
Um, so there's a BMC Geriatrics and others there, medstopper.com, and then the stop and start tool. And I, all of those are active links. So hopefully you can access those when you get my slides. The following steps, step two is to really determine if the medication dose can be reduced or the medication stopped. It's often worth a try, right? If we are concerned about a potential med, um, often one of the easiest, most approachable steps to take is say, hey, can we try it? Um, let's, I'm thinking we could try a dose reduction and see how you do with that. Um, and planning a tapering and withdrawal steps with your patient. And then as you go along, monitoring it for adverse events um, and tell the patient up front, you know, well, if it doesn't go well, then we could talk about going back to the prior dose. But given the risks of this medication, I think it would be worth trying to go down on the dose and see how you do. Um, and it's important to consider uh, how to best engage the patient in the conversation about deprescribing. And I have uh, these resources here on deprescribing.org is great. Um, there's additionally like scripts, pamphlets, lots of information and resources for uh, prescribers out there who may be facing some challenging situations with deprescribing. And of course, the final step in deprescribing is to document the outcomes um, so that down the line, you or others involved in this individual's care, you know, doesn't have to reinvent the wheel and uh, just make it clear somewhere that, you know, they fail the dose reduction or they fail this um, medication due to X, Y, or Z effect or successfully um, tapered off just um, really is helpful in the future. Um Okay. I just had a question and I'm a little bit um, behind on this, but Beth had said that previous speakers yeah. have recommended having patients not drinking fluids unless thirsty to decrease incontinence and nocturia. However, dehydration and associated postural hypotension also are common causes of falls. How do you balance those issues, especially in light of the fact that thirst drive is diminished as we age? Yeah, so that's a great question. I actually work um, as far as, you know, where, where I sit, I feel that maintaining hydration and maintaining um, balance and preventing falls trumps um, some, you know, issues with incontinence management. Of course, it comes down to the patient's preference. But I educate patients to really try to load up on fluids earlier in the day um, and encourage hydration, you know, aiming for sometimes if, if especially with folks with um, decreased thirst drive, I try to say, well, can we aim for two glasses with each meal or a glass with the meal and a glass um, shortly after the meal so that they're at least getting, you know, eight by eight is the, you know, gold standard, I'll take six by eight ounces. So eight by eight ounces is, is often what we preach. I'll take six, meaning two with each meal. And um, other things that can contribute to urinary incontinence, of course, also is concentrated urine um, is very irritating to the bladder. Um, urine that, um, it, it, like if you're dealing with, um, urge incontinence, say, I think it's equally important to um, educate patients on what they're drinking may be contributing to a more irritable bladder, more urgency, more episodes of incontinence, so avoiding acidified juices, coffee, carbonated stuff, um, encouraging other forms of other drinks, trying to front load the day earlier in the day. Um, those things are all really important. Uh, and so uh, I often feel that patients will avoid drinking because of that concern. And so I try to educate them on those fronts. Hopefully that answered the question. Any other questions before I touch a base on the uh, study toolkit? Okay, so this, the study initiative is a great online resource. I hope some of you are familiar with. 
It is the Stopping Elderly Accidents, Death, and Injuries Initiative. It was developed by the CDC. It's based on American and British Geriatric Society's clinical practice guidelines for preventing for prevention of falls in older persons, and it was designed with input from healthcare providers. It offers tools and resources to help healthcare providers screen, assess, and intervene to reduce falls. And here's, I know it's way too busy of a slide. I just wanted to give you an idea that um, this document, the study algorithm truly covers a lot of ground. So up at the tip talking about when to screen, how to screen your patients, and if they screen as on the far left, not a risk for falling, how to respond if they are a risk, all of the different things to assess. And then from there, how, what your interventions might look like um, for those risk factors that you were able to assess and the follow-up plan. So if you can't uh, remember my slides or anybody else's slides or, or looking for a paper or this or that, just Google um, the CDC study algorithm and it's incredibly helpful for uh, providers and nurses and others involved in care. And also there's other um, materials that I'll show you as well. So as far as screening, if you have a patient who's over 65, they should be asked at least once a year um, if they are concerned about falling um, or if they have any of these other, I'll show you these, these three questions. Um, so at least yearly or if they present with an acute fall. And there's two validated screening tools. One is the three key questions asking, have you fallen in the past year? Do you feel unsteady when standing or walking? And do you worry about falling? If they answer yes to any one of those questions, that person needs a falls risk assessment. And if they answer no, then you can recommend strategies to prevent future falls. And the two biggies are to um, recommend a vitamin D supplement and some sort of community-based exercise that includes a focus on balance. The other tool, um, if, if, uh, if it interests you or, or could be implemented in your practice is the CDC's Stay Independent Questionnaire, which is great because it's a screening and it also is an educational piece. So the going through and asking questions about falls, fear of falling, um, and then explaining why each question is relevant. Um, so this is also a wonderful questionnaire and can be implemented in a, in a practice. And, this, and with this one, if you score four or more more points than you're considered at risk for falling and needing a fall risk assessment. So um, this is it in more detail, a little bit closer view, but you can get the idea uh, that it covers quite a bit of ground. Also from the study toolkit, there's these great patient handouts. Um, the check for safety one we use all the time in Falls Clinic, it's a nice, home safety checklist that you can give to folks that they can go over, you know, how their home is looking and what things they can maybe tweak or modify to reduce the risk of falling. The one about postural hypotension, there's one for family caregivers, and also a great general guide for fall prevention there on the far right. There's also great um, resources for providers um, there's one, the coordinated care plan to prevent older adult falls and uh, an evaluation guide for older adult clinical fall prevention programs. So um, a lot of great tools. So you don't feel like you have to reinvent the wheel again. Um, someone's already do, done all this great work. And these are um, tools that are uh, freely available. Medication, or sorry, information is also available for pharmacists. And there's a informative handout for providers about uh, medications that are linked to falling as well. So putting this all together, I wanted to um, talk briefly about what we do in the fall prevention clinic. So uh, we do a, a comprehensive fall risk assessment and management for those who have fallen or they're a risk for falls essentially. Mostly we're seeing geriatric folks, but some under 65 and 
um, Dr. Phelan, Dr. Elizabeth Phelan will do a review of the referral before accepting someone under 65, but we do see some young folks. Um, and we're seeing mostly outpatients or those nearing SNF discharge. It's a very interdisciplinary approach. We have a dedicated medical assistant who's rooming the patient, doing the timed up and go assessment. Christina will talk about that, checking orthostatics and visual acuity testing. And um, of course we have uh, in-person or telephonic interpreters available. So we're doing a comprehensive identification of all their fall risk factors, checking out their gait and balance, looking at their assistive device needs, tweaking medications, educating patients and caregivers. And I would say the bulk of what we do is education. And then sometimes I'm also doing some lab tests and imaging. And all of these elements can be done in the primary care setting. So I wanted to share the, the SPLAT acronym with you all. Um, and uh, I have Christina, my physical therapist slash patient who hopefully can unmute herself. I don't know. Yes, I was going to ask her some questions. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so Christina, um, we are going to base this conversation on uh, pr prior stories that we've heard in Falls Clinic um, to educate and slightly entertain. Um, so Christina, I'm so sorry to hear about the fall that you had recently. Um, did you have like symptoms before before the fall? Yeah, you know, I, um, I'm so happy to see you today because this has been a real bother. I, I got out of my car. I, I really had to go to the bathroom and I was kind of rushing, ran okay. up the steps and I got dizzy. I got like, you know, Oh, shoot. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Got yeah. it. And so you were rushing and, um, a little incontinent. We're not feeling incontinent, but we're rushing to the bathroom. Yeah, you know, and, you know when you get uh, home, you, really you were up the go. stairs. Yes, right. That turnkey mm -hmm. uh, urge to go. And sorry, just to time out real quick, I forgot to say if anybody has um, any thoughts about this history or anything that jumps out at you as being a risk factor for falling, I encourage you to throw it in the chat. Um, but back to Christina. So tell me, have you had other falls in the past? Well, I mean, I'm 78 and I just kind of assume everybody has falls. I'm, I mean, I thought that was kind of normal and I, I'm not really sure what I can do about that, but I, I did have one. Oh. Um, I had, I got up on my step stool, just, you know, it's totally safe. Ooh. I, I keep my popcorn maker up in this cabinet. So I got up on the step oh. stool. I'm, you know, I'm kind of like reaching and looking, um, and I fell and the popcorn maker broke and it's a total, oh, bummer, shoot. that's, okay. that's the only place I have to keep it. I see. Okay. So up on the step stool. All right. And, and I forgot to ask you earlier, are you afraid of falling? I am now, you know, I am now. Yeah. I, okay. I you okay. know, I've had two. Yeah. Right. And do you feel like you avoid activities or leaving the house because of that fear of falling? No, I mean, okay. not, not quite yet. I don't, I don't feel like I'm there okay. yet. Okay. Got it. Okay. And as far as location or, or where you fell, you mentioned you were on the stairs. Is that right? Yeah. I've got like six steps up, you know, to my front door. Um, okay. I just gotten back from Trader there... Joe's. Oh, okay. So shopping. Yeah. Okay. And, and on those stairs, do you, do you have a railing to hold on to? I don't mm -mm. No, It's like, a, Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. No, no railing. Yeah. And is it, is there lighting there? Well, I have, I do have a porch light, but it's been like flickering and it finally just went out and I don't, I don't really have anybody that can help me replace it. Okay. Got it. Okay. Um, and so you said, as far as A for activity, um, you said you were shopping. So were you carrying groceries? Yes, I did my week of grocery shopping. Okay. So I had like two, two bags, one on each hand. Okay. And I, I see you have your cane with you here in clinic. Did, were you using your cane at the time? Oh yeah. No. Um, so when I go to Trader Joe's, I just use the cart and I just kind of, I hold on to oh, that. I can okay. get around the store. 
Um, Got it. Yeah. Okay. All right. And um, so, and what time of day was this? You know, it was like kind of early evening um, and this was a few months ago. Okay. So it was starting to get dark. Yeah. And then, yeah. Yeah. Got it. Okay. All right. And then when you fell, did you fall on your side or which direction did you fall? I fell backwards. Um, oh, I hurt shoot. my okay. tailbone Have... really badly. Okay. I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, and when you fell, did it take you a while to get up or did someone have to come help you? Yeah, I, I really couldn't get up. There wasn't anything that I could like, I was in a lot of pain and I couldn't really grab onto anything. Um, so a neighbor found me okay. like a oh, couple okay. hours later. Okay. Got it. All yeah, right. She helped me out. Well, thank you for sharing all that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, Christina. Um, yeah. So just wanted to highlight, of course, that, you know, this is, we were able to elucidate a bunch of the risk factors here. So she, she was dizzy. She was rushing. She was carrying items, multitasking. She was not using her assistive device. Um, she had a prior fall and a prior fall related to behavioral concerns, you know, getting up on a step stool. Um, and um, that, you know, the home environment's not safe. We don't have a railing. We don't have a light. Um, and also that she's at risk for long lie in the future. So I really need to think about uh, getting her a personal alert device or considering um, a different living situation potentially or um, more caregiver assistance at home. So just as a little example of a history. So um, I don't want to cut into Christina's time too much, but briefly in, in the falls clinic, you know, we're getting orthostatics. We do the gait and balance evaluation. We check leg strength. I'm looking at foot sensation um, and deformities. Again, looking for any signs of Parkinsonism and um, doing a visual acuity check. So 20 over 40 or worse is considered uh, impairment enough to increase fall risk. And I'm always checking out if they're wearing bifocals because bifocals can contribute to falls. When people are losing their balance, their eyes will move to that blurry lower portion of the lens faster than their, eye, their neck can adjust. So folks, when they're walking around outside should really try to wear a single focus lens rather than bifocals. I'll be doing a cardiac exam in clinic. And then sometimes I do obtain lab studies or get a DEXA scan. So often it's a B12 level, a vitamin D level, a CK level, looking for a muscle breakdown if there's concern for something like a myopathy, thyroid check, looking for anemia, looking for renal function, um, and a DEXA scan, of course, if um, there's concern about osteoporosis, which often there is. So really the strategy in Falls Clinic is just to go after all of those modifiable fall risk factors that we've been um, talking about this whole time. And the frequent components are exercise, 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 um, really working to get the patient to have buy-in and understanding of the importance of exercise and engaging with physical therapy. We do a lot of, I do a lot of de-prescribing um, really working at the home and environmental modifications, um, behavioral modifications, as I mentioned, the education that we do with, with patients, working on postural hypotension. So that might be encouraging hydration, or there's some other um, modifications like instructing patients to do some fist pumps and ankle pumps before standing up, getting up slowly or I may be going after some medications that I think are causing that postural hypotension, but where, you know, getting folks out of their uh, Crocs in sport mode, as Christina says, um, and uh, recommending some vitamin D supplementation and referring patients to other providers and other disciplines, especially, you know, ophthalmology, ortho, uh, neurology, or to our dementia clinic. Um, and then uh, Christina will talk about PT, but, you know, home health PT is something that I will refer folks to if um, they're homebound or if, if that's um, truly the most that they can handle. But knowing that home health PT, the goals are not going to be as advanced as outpatient PT. So sometimes we're able to 
engage someone in home health PT and graduate them to outpatient PT and then graduate them from outpatient PT to a community-based exercise program. And I wanted to give a little shout out to adult day centers as being an excellent resource for group exercise um, in a supervised supportive setting um, because I work with one, but um, that's just my own bias. And then a home safety evaluation um, the One Step Ahead program is what's available in King County, and there are other programs available via AAAs um, to go out and do a home safety evaluation with the goal of reducing 911 calls for falls, or I may engage home health, OT, or PT to do a home safety evaluation. And the goals are really, you know, the goal is zero falls. That's what we tell our patients. The goal is zero falls. It's not an accepted this is not a normal part of aging, right? So to educate patients to drop that idea. Um, and then also reducing injury from falls. And I talked about the personal alert system earlier um, and addressing um, osteoporosis when applicable and counseling about risky behaviors. Uh, and sometimes I do see folks who are on anticoagulation or blood thinners and uh, their provider is nervous about them being on blood thinners so I'm there to really help reduce their fall risk to make taking anticoagulation uh, safer for the patient. And overall, really, we're just working to preserve the highest possible level of mobility for the patient. So thanks for listening to my uh, spiel about falls. And thanks to Christina and Elizabeth, um, the falls clinic team at Harborview. Elizabeth uh, shared some of her slides with me, I think. <laughs> from a couple iterations ago. And um, yes, it's an honor to work with you both. And I am going to pass it off to Christina, who is going to teach you guys a lot of great things. It's always a treat to hear from a physical therapist, I think. Uh, and Christina is no exception. So take it away. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Rebecca Carson. That was awesome. Full of tons of useful information. I am just gonna round it out with talking a little bit about um, some gait assessment, some strength and balance tests, some assistive devices and exercise programs. Um, assessing gait can be kind of daunting and you can certainly leave the super, super detailed work to your fellow rehab team members. Um, but I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the things we see commonly, um, because if you can assess someone's gait and find a gait impairment, you you know, you might want to refer them to rehab and to physical therapy to help with that and reduce the fall risk. So with gait analysis, it's probably easiest to break it down into the different planes of movement. So if you're looking at the frontal plane, this would be like having the patient walk towards you and then maybe turn around and walk away from you. And some things that you can really pick up here are kind of looking at their legs and how much time they spend in the stance phase or that time where their foot is in contact with the ground and really kind of compare that side to side. Does it look like they spend the same amount of time on each leg or do they wanna really shift their weight off of a leg? Maybe it's painful and we might call that intelligent gait. We might also be able to see when we're looking at them in this view, if they've got some really functional hip weakness where when they're on their standing leg, the side of the pelvis opposite that drops down. So that would mean they've got weakness in their side seat or their glute medius on that standing leg side. And that can be really problematic for balance and for gait. In the sagittal plane, it's probably easiest if you see them walk past you. So you're observing the side of them and you don't need to observe your patient in all of these planes. But even if you can just choose one, this one is full of, full of lots of things to assess. So you can easily see here basically how big of a step they're taking. And again, does that step length look the same on the right versus the left? Um, how high is their foot? You know, when they swing their leg over the ground, are they clearing the ground? Are they shuffling? Are they scuffing? Do you hear it? I often will cue them in on like, I hear that foot. Um, and then that's, that's a little feedback for them. We can look at if they're dorsiflexing their ankle enough to lift their toes up and clear their toes. 
Obviously, if they're not clearing their toes, that's a major tripping hazard. And you know, you will see that with folks with foot drop. And in that case, you might see a compensation of them really flexing their hip and their knee like they're marching or kind of like a steppage gait. And then we can also look for push off. So that leg that's trying to propel the body forward with each step. Uh, we can see some reduction in strength and power, and we want to make sure we're maintaining that for our patients. And we also can see just their overall posture in this view. Um, we can see if they've got a forward head or a thoracic kyphosis, or if they kind of stand in that hips flexed, you know, knees bent position. And in the last plane, in the transverse plane, what you mainly will see there is if their trunk is rotating and if their arms are swinging. So I have a video, there is no sound on this video and I might, it's short, so I may play it a couple times because I want you to kind of see what I see when I'm looking at gait. And I tend to try to do sort of a ground up approach just to have some kind of system of, of looking at this. So we'll play this for you. And you can see this green line. I'm, I'm not really gonna talk much about the green line. This was just a great video to find. So starting from the ground, you can see how big of a step he takes. So on the left, see that one. And then the right, he doesn't pass up his left foot, but with the left, he does pass up his right foot. So there's an asymmetry there in his step length. He's not really dorsiflexing his ankles. And because he's taking these small steps, he's really not getting much step height. From there, kind of moving up, he's not getting a lot of knee flexion during swing. And his hip almost stays in a bit of a flexed or bent posture during a lot of his walking. So that makes me want to really check the height of that assistive device and ask him if he's ever been trained on how to use it. Moving up, you can see here he's got a little bit of a kyphosis in the thoracic spine and just this kind of stooped posture here. So his center of gravity is hanging out a little bit forward. And then lastly, how he uses the walker here. He's setting the back two legs down first before the front two. So that's not going to give him a lot of stability. If he were to lose his balance with just those back two legs down, he's not going to have as much um, ability to recover his balance as he would if all four legs were down. So there's a lot of equipment recommendations that we make in Falls Clinic. And I wanted to talk you through some of the common ones that we see and how we make our recommendations. And hopefully this will be helpful for you. We'll start talking about just canes. And again, I know there's a lot of words on the next two slides, but I'm gonna talk you through these. The main ones that you'll see are the single point cane and then the quad cane. So the single point cane can definitely improve balance. It is adjustable, but it's really just a minimal support device. So this is not for somebody who really needs to offload their leg or needs a lot of help with balance. Um, someone who maybe just holds a hand for a little bit of support sometimes, maybe could benefit from a cane um, or someone who has some mild sensory or vestibular impairments or maybe a mild visual impairment. The cane touching the ground every time is giving them a little bit of information about what's happening on the ground without them having to maybe look at every single, every single square inch of the ground. Um, also helpful with like a mild um, intensity of you know, leg pain or you know, leg joint pain. With a quad cane, it does offer a larger base of support um, and you can bear some more weight through it. So sometimes these are used for folks that have one-sided weakness like hemiparesis, you know, in addition to their fall risk. Um, and these should be adjustable as well and they do stand on their own, which for that, the main benefit I think is that they might not forget it. Um, we have patients all the time set their canes down in the restaurant or um, they leave it in the car. So maybe a little bit easier to remember if it's right there. Um, it's a little bit heavier and I will say it's pretty challenging to get all four points on the ground with every single step. Um, so I, I really have patients practice with these first before maybe recommending them um, and it may not fit on stairs. With our walkers, there's 
three different types that we usually see. So on the left there, you have the standard walker without wheels. And in the middle, there's the front wheeled walker or the two wheeled walker. And then all the way to the right there is the four wheeled walker. So the standard walker is really the most stable of the bunch. It also folds pretty easily. These are aluminum and pretty lightweight. But the con is really that it has to be picked up with every step, just as you saw the gentleman in the video. So this does slow down walking speed um, and it doesn't feel as much like a normal walking speed. So someone who's got more severe deficits in strength, in sensation, um, maybe they have more severe balance issues, or if someone's had like a leg fracture and really needs to offload weight, this would be a good device. Maybe somebody who's non weight bearing after a foot surgery or something. The two wheeled walker allows someone to have a little bit more of a normal gait pattern because they can just push it. They don't have to pick it up with every single step. And that's, you know, that's a definite benefit there. The hard part is that when you want to turn with these, I, I teach people all the time, you have to be able to kind of turn it a little, then adjust your feet, then turn it a little more and adjust your feet, or else you're looking at like a pretty wide turning radius. You got to have a lot of room. And it is slightly less stable than that standard walker. So someone who's got lower extremity arthritis, poor balance, um, you know, more weakness or neuropathy, um, or someone who has Parkinson's could definitely benefit from a walker like this. The last one is the four-wheeled walker. So these are probably the easiest to propel and move around with because those front wheels revolve. So really easy to turn. Um, however, they're the least stable of the bunch. So always balancing mobility with stability and safety. Um, we love these for folks who might have fall risk, um, but a little less endurance knowing that they can put the brakes on and sit down wherever they're at. It kind of helps encourage them to start doing a little more because they know no matter what, they're going to have a seat to sit down on. Um, and there is a basket for storage. You know, sometimes we see folks come in with the other two walkers with bags and groceries and all kinds of stuff hanging off of them. And it can really weight them down and change how it's used and make it a lot less safe. These do fold but not quite as compact though. I do, you know, I think they still can fit into a trunk of a car and you really can't use these to offload a lot of weight in the legs. So someone who's got more, you know, severe pain or injury to the lower leg isn't, may not be able to use this. So the folks that have the generalized decrease in endurance, um, spinal stenosis where sitting and taking a break makes a huge difference, then they can get up and go again, um, or any kind of moderate type of arthritis or, you know, cardiovascular issues. A few tips to consider. These are things you might hear your patients say. These are things we hear our patients say a lot um, that, yeah, I, you know what? I, I go out and I go shopping. I'm just always holding my husband or my caregiver or my daughter. Um, it's really not safe for either party to always need to be holding on to each other. Plus it's, it makes them not independent fully. So we always want to consider something like a cane or a walker. Sometimes we're getting people to agree to hiking poles because they look a little more sporty. Um, so they might start there if they're a little hesitant. Or you might hear your patient talk about how they don't need to use anything inside their home. They, they know where all the, all the furniture is. I got the wall, I've got my dresser, I've got the counter. But in reality, they could be somewhere and lose their balance and not have those things right there. So another instance where they could really benefit from a cane or a walker even inside their home. And just like Dr. Rohrbeck talked about the bathroom, you know, if someone's had a slip or a fall or they've got difficulty getting off the toilet because they're a little bit weak, you know, these are instances where you're starting to think about equipment like grab bars. Um, we're not huge fans of the suction cup grab bars because we feel like those could still fail. Um, so getting properly installed grab bars, um, non-slip surfaces in the tub or, you know, a non-slip mat that then gets picked up after the bath or shower and, you know, hung up. Raised toilet seats come with and without handles. So those make it a lot easier for people to get up off the toilet. Um, and for anyone who really can't stand without support or they get symptoms in standing, it's a good idea to be thinking about using a walker, sitting to shower and bathe, making sure grab bars are there. And you know, it really is all of our responsibility as healthcare providers to be 
at least doing a quick assessment of this equipment that folks come in with. So as they're coming into their clinic appointment, if you notice tips are worn down, it's probably not safe anymore. If the brakes on the four-wheeled walker aren't working anymore, then that's unsafe if they go to sit down in it. Um, so always consider referral to PT if you need help with training. They've never gotten the right training. Um, you know, writing orders for replacement equipment is fantastic. And also checking the fit of the device. A super quick and easy um, look is if they're standing up straight with their arms at their sides, the handle to whatever device they're using, the walker or the cane, should be at the crease of their wrist when they're standing up. So that's just a, a quick tip there. And then there's some other objective testing you could do. Now, we're not certainly expecting you guys to do all of these, um, but even if you just picked one and it would help you better understand where your patient is with strength, balance, walking, and know whether or not um, a referral to physical therapy would be a good idea. So there's three main tests. This follows the CDC's recommendation in that study guideline. So there's the chair stand test, which is a test of functional lower extremity strength. We see all the time, we'll do a manual muscle test and it's like strong resistance, no problem, doing great. And then our next question is, can you stand up from the chair without using your arms or your hands to push? And often people can't. So that test of functional leg strength is super important. Um, we also, our, our medical assistants are amazing and they actually do the timed up and go test for us. So it gives us a little info on dynamic or moving balance when people are walking and stepping as well as gait. And then the four stage balance test is really more of a test of static balance. So all of these have evidence-based norms um, for age and sometimes age and gender, um, and it helps patients understand where they're at. And then over time, you can keep tracking these as they're participating in rehab or exercise programs and see how they've improved. So for each test, I'm gonna share a quick video on how to do it. And then, um, so there are three of them and also the resource for the CDC. The 30 second chair stand tests functional lower body strength. To administer this test, you'll need a chair with a straight back and a stopwatch. Place the rear legs of the chair against a wall so that it cannot slide backwards. Have your patient sit towards the front of the chair and fold her arms across her chest. Ask her to keep her feet flat on the floor and sit upright. She should try to stand up, keeping her arms folded across her chest without pushing off with her arms. When you say go, she should stand up all the way and then sit back down, doing this as quickly as she can until you say stop. Arms should remain folded across her chest throughout the test. Stand close enough so that you can catch the patient if she loses her balance. If the patient gets tired, she may rest, but let the time keep going. If she cannot stand even once, the test score is zero. Not being able to stand up from a chair without using one's arms to push up indicates a high risk for falls. Record the number of times the patient stood up in 30 seconds. If the patient is over halfway to a standing position at the end of 30 seconds, count it as a stand. Now, based on the age and sex of your patient, find their normal range on this chart. If your patient's score is below the norm for his or her age and gender, it indicates lower body weakness, a risk factor for falling. If the patient can't stand up even once without using her hands, allow her to push off using a hand on the chair be sure to document any adaptations. The test score is still zero for purposes of comparing to normative standards, but this way her personal performance can be evaluated from one assessment to the next. I find this test is very helpful for monitoring the effects of strength training. It's also useful for motivating patients because they can see how much they improve by doing strengthening exercises on a regular basis. Okay, and then here is a resource from the study toolkit, and it can be a really great job aid too if you wanna help some of your staff learn how to do it. It takes 30 seconds and it's a wonderful objective measure of their functional strength. This is the timed up and go or the tug test. The timed up and go or tug tests functional mobility. To perform the test, you need a chair and a stopwatch, 
or a wristwatch with a second hand. Have your patient start by sitting on the chair, feet flat on the floor, one foot slightly in front of the other, and hands on the armrests of the chair. Put a line on the floor 10 feet or 3 meters away. Ask your patient to stand up from the chair and walk at her normal pace to the line on the floor when you say go. When she reaches the line, she should turn around, walk back to the chair, and sit down. Be sure to start timing on the signal go, and even if your patient has not started to move, and stop timing at the moment she sits back down in the chair. While she's walking, stand between the chair and the line in case the patient loses her balance and you need to assist. Observe and note the patient's posture, width of the base of support, step height, stride length, arm swing, and path. When the test is complete, record the time. Also record whether the patient used an assistive device, and if so, what type. A community dwelling older adult who takes more than 12 seconds to complete the tug is at increased risk of falling. Timed up and go, um, kind of a job aid. It's perfect, it's really easy to see how to do that test. And lastly, I'll show you the four stage balance test. I don't hear the audio, but you could probably explain what uh, what they're doing. <laughs> not you sure try. why the audio is not working on this one, but basically this is a series of positions that you're gonna have your patient put their foot in. This is testing static balance or when they're standing in place. So the first position is with their feet together. And the goal is that they can hold it for 10 seconds. Then you make it a little bit harder and then you have them do Kind of show with my hands a semi tandem position with their feet again see if they can hold it 10 seconds then it's like a full tandem position you're going to kind of see her go through that there she's in semi tandem then full tandem and then lastly you'll have the patient try to stand on one foot and again if they can't complete 10 seconds of the first version then you stop the test there and there is the instructions from the study toolkit. So I'm gonna go pretty quickly through the exercise programs because I wanna make sure we have enough time for questions. Um, you'll be able to refer back to these slides if, um, if you've got more questions on the exercise programs too. The main thing is that you wanna make sure your patient's always doing balance exercises, um, preferably strength and balance. And if they're doing balance, you wanna make sure they're doing balance exercises where they are standing in place, but also where they're moving. Um, so a sitting exercise program isn't really gonna get it done for them. Um, and so for some people who really aren't ready to engage in community exercise or some kind of exercise class could really benefit from working with a physical therapist one-on-one -on -one first. So we'll go through this list of some home programs and community-based programs. So Otago is a program that was developed in New Zealand, um, and it's for anyone 65 and older who's had a fall, possibly a complex medical history, or maybe more on the frail end, who really isn't ready to participate in a community class, maybe because they've got some decreased strength, coordination, balance. So it's a set of exercises that are gradually progressed, and it's overseen by a PT or a PTA. Um, and they're going to be doing some of the exercises in clinic, um, and at home. And the real difference with this program is that it's monitored for a very long duration. And there's actually phone visits as part of the setup with this. The Tai Chi Moving for Better Balance program is a program that we, that is kind of our main program that we provide um, as the intervention for balance exercises in 
via the fall prevention clinic. So this is one that can be done at home, but also in the community. So I'll explain that a little bit better. Um, Tai Chi is definitely a buzzword when it comes to fall prevention. And if you can't find a Tai Chi moving for better balance class, then likely, you know, a community Tai Chi class is still going to be very, very good. Um, this one's got some excellent evidence behind it. In 2018, they did their landmark study where they compared the Tai Chi to a control group who was stretching. And then another group who was doing balance exercises that you might see just common, basic, you know, stand on one foot, stand on a piece of foam, things like that. Um, and so it was 60% better at reducing falls than the stretching group, and even 30% better at reducing falls than that group that was doing basic balance exercises. And I think that's because with Tai Chi, it incorporates all of the strategies that our body should be using to recover from a loss of balance. So there's a lot of ankle work, hip work, and then a stepping strategy as well as static balance exercises and dynamic or moving balance exercises with the idea that you're really shifting your center of gravity around your base of support with really good control. Um, the exercises have to be moderately challenging. And you know, evidence is that you have to do about 50 hours of balance practice to really see significant differences um, in fall frequency and fall risk, though we can usually start measuring changes ahead of that. So again, someone could be working with a physical therapist and doing some of these exercises at home, or they could get a class in the community. Um, we are finding that a lot of the senior centers and community centers are back up and running with their group exercise classes. So um, Tai Chi is one of the best things we have out there. Enhanced Fitness is also a great program. It's for older adults of all fitness levels taught by a certified instructor. And it also includes not only with stretching, um, strengthening, it does include static and dynamic balance exercises, and it's pretty low cost. You can find these at community centers and I believe even YMCAs, and there are certain um, medical insurances that will cover this as well. So a great resource to look into with your patients. Matter of balance is really geared towards people who have a fear of falling. They're starting to limit that um, activity and, and limit things that they do or wanna do because they're really afraid um, to fall. So this is a series of classes that's offered in person and virtually where people work in small groups. It's a nationally recognized program. Um, and again, available at a lot of senior centers um, and community centers. And then the SAIL program, it stands for Stay Active and Independent for Life. It's for people 65 and older. Um, it's a three time a week class. Again, it's got strength, static and dynamic balance. That's what we're looking for. Um, and some fitness exercises. I've provided some research on all of these so you can see what the evidence is, but I'll, I'll, I wanna make sure we have time for questions. And then just a brief mention that recently there was published the World Falls Guidelines where a multidisciplinary team from 39 countries came together and put together um, expert recommendations on how to help manage falls. And it really tried to also help include this very person-centered approach. So if you haven't seen it yet, it's a great resource. Um, so far, what we're seeing is, is that a lot of what we're doing is still continues to be in align with the World Falls Guidelines, but we're all looking through it to make sure we're not missing anything. Um, these are just my reference slides for future reference, and I wanted to say thank you and thanks to Dr. Rohrbeck for presenting together, and if you have questions, please feel free to email me in case we don't get to them all today. Well, this was so great. What an incredibly comprehensive um, discussion about falls and really appreciate all the guidance and the resources and and actually going through the exercise program and I didn't know about the world falls whatever you called that so thank you for that resource I appreciate that um, so um, let's see I had one here um, Cindy was wondering if you could say a bit more about the emotional and psychological risk factors for falling such as depression which can cause slowness, inaction, loss of concentration, and anxiety, which can cause hurrying and jerky movements, so on. There is evidence that these need to be assessed and addressed because of their ability to impact our patients physically. 
Yes, absolutely. I did throw in in the chat there that um, screening for depression and anxiety is uh, a part of our assessment at the Falls Clinic and is something that I agree is very important in um, a Falls uh, risk, especially um, also anxiety and fear of falling as it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If um, someone is uh, fearful of falling or frankly depressed, anything that's going to lead or anxious and agoraphobic, et cetera, um, not wanting to leave the house, being therefore more deconditioned and more likely to fall, it becomes this sort of downward spiral. So addressing um, mood disorders is very important and addressing them with keeping in mind which medications you might want to avoid um, as certain ones can increase fall risk. And they can, um, as I recall, you can just, if they don't have those, you can just um, put that in the search box, right? The PHQ or the geriatric depression scale. Um, Absolutely, yeah, they're yeah. everywhere. <laughs> yes, very easy to find those. And and PHQ is just the, the two main questions. Are you down and depressed? feeling hopeless or, or or are you anhedonic are you not enjoying things and and commenting on how often and then if someone screens kind of positive for that then i'll explore further with the phq9 which kind of gives more information about the severity of depression and so if you're initiating treatment you can follow that score as a marker for how they're doing on your um, treatment plan and christine i'm wondering if you might be able to have a perspective on some of these programs and their availability since we're kind of out to a six state area um how people would find out what might be available in their area yeah that's a good question i tried to provide some resources there and i tried uh -huh. to pick fairly regionally available courses and classes um, so i think that starting with local community centers and senior centers um, you can, you know, type in enhanced fitness or even type in Tai Chi. And then, you know, from there looking at YMCAs, um, but going to each of these places websites that's also included in there, um, whether it be in my references or kind of going via the citations that I've included, there's going to be a find a class um, search bar. So I oh, that's that, a good point. That's a really yeah. good point. Yeah. Yeah. And then just kind of keeping in mind, if you can't find some of those, I mean, we, I wanted to present evidence-based ones specifically for fall prevention. If you're not having success, then know what to look for. Something that's got strength and balance, both static and dynamic. And knowing, of course, that a seated exercise program is not going to address falls. So, um, yeah. you know, and that's, you know, Pointing out the obvious, but sometimes patients will be, yes, I'm doing whatever class, Tai Chi even, or yoga. And then you find out a few minutes later, oh, it's actually a seated yoga class. And you're like, shoot, you know, almost. Um, but, you know, there are classes where they can incorporate the chair, but maybe they're holding on to it to steady themselves for part of it or have the option to steady themselves with the chair encouraging someone to push themselves as far as they safely can. But that's where one-on-one -on -one PT is often the starting point to get somebody in shape for a group class so that everybody in the community center doesn't get real nervous about your patient who showed up to the class uh, not looking too steady. But when in doubt, lean towards Tai Chi. Um, if you can find a, a community Tai Chi class, it's, a, it's usually a safe bet. Oh, great. Any other questions, folks? I have a feeling some people are headed outside to the sunny weather. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you guys. I hope you're all having sunny weather where you're at, by the way. <laughs> a little overcast, not bad. Is here. it? Right. I'm down in Eugene, Oregon right at the moment, and it's very sunny here. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, good for you. All right. Well, well thanks, everybody, I, for your attention. Um, I really appreciate um all of this information and if there's additional questions feel free to um, send them along you've got um i think christina's email and um you can check in with me um and beyond that i'll just wish everyone a nice evening and um
we'll see you next week for our last session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.